Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. So welcome to today's video. Today, we're gonna be talking about what happened to 11-year-old Giselle Garrido Cruz. This is a case where a little girl went to a nearby cafe in the morning, a cyber cafe that she had been to many times before with her family. It should have been a normal day for her, but unfortunately, Giselle was another victim of femicide in Mexico. It's very unfortunate that whenever femicides involve a minor, people heavily criticize the mothers, the fathers, a family for allowing it to happen or when it's an adult woman that is murdered people criticize her for not making better decisions it's important to remember that this could be any one of our friends daughters sisters mothers cousins and it's so important to spread awareness about this in an empathetic manner at the end of the day the victims are not to blame for what happened to them the only people that should be blamed or receive any type of hate are the horrible horrible people that commit these terrible crimes and I totally understand like looking back at a case and being like oh like why did she do this like she should have done that or god the parents shouldn't have like let her go by herself you know I understand that because sometimes like those thoughts come into my head as well but I swear once you just like watch an interview with the family members or with people close to the victim you will see that these people are not to blame and that they couldn't have known that this would have happened and again at the end of the day the only person that should be blamed is the killer with that I did just want to say thank you guys for being so supportive you guys are truly the best familia ever and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos and helping me spread awareness with that let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Giselle Giselle Garrido Cruz was born on April 7th, 2007 in Chimalhuacan, Mexico City to her parents Miriam and Rigoberto. She was the middle child of two siblings and at this point she was 11 years old, she was in the 6th grade and she had a huge passion for soccer. Like every single interview that I watched with her friends and family, everyone always brought up soccer and how Giselle was just absolutely obsessed with the sport. She loved playing it, she played for a local team in her community and her dream job was to become a professional soccer player. On the weekends, she loved going out with her friends to go play soccer, and she was just a very active person. Her friends and family say that she was also very happy, she was very playful, and she would spend a lot of time with her family. Her mom said that she had these like beautiful freckles on her nose and on her cheeks, and that she was just such a beautiful little girl. Her parents worked really hard to give their children the best life possible. Her mom worked at a local store while her father worked as a public transportation driver, so they would work very long hours hours but they would do it for the sake of their family. They were all just really close, everyone in the community knew who this family was and honestly everything seemed to be going well for them but Unfortunately, everything would change on January 19th, 2019. That day was a Saturday and it was supposed to be like any other day. Giselle's parents left to work early in the morning and Giselle was left home alone with her two siblings. Before leaving, Miriam told her kids that when they woke up later to communicate with her and with their father about their plans. Because again, it was a Saturday so most kids would like go play with their friends, maybe someone would go to the movies, to the mall, etc. And the kids did not have a computer or a cell phone. So the only way that they could communicate with their parents was through Facebook. Now, the only way they could get access to their Facebook was at a cyber cafe. Now, I'm sure there's still a ton of these around, but for those that don't know, a cyber cafe is a store where you can pay to use a computer. I used to go to those all the time when I was a kid and I would play Club Penguin on them. It was a really fun place when you were little and it's basically just like a room with a bunch of computers. Sometimes they sell coffee or food, soda or like paletas. So Giselle and her siblings would often go to cyber cafes to communicate with their parents or to communicate with their friends. That day, Giselle had made plans to go play soccer with her friends in the evening, but before that, she wanted to spend some time with her dad. She would often join him on the bus while he drove because she liked to keep him company and she just really liked to spend time with her dad. Now, this was a very last minute plan. It's not like the night before or in the morning she had told her parents, hey, I want to meet up with dad and ride the bus with him. This was a very last minute plan, so she needed to go to the cyber cafe to message her mom 
mom on Facebook to let her know, hey, I want to go on the bus with dad today. Can you tell me where his next bus stop is going to be? And then that way they could coordinate like where Giselle would get picked up. So Giselle told her siblings that she would be leaving and she left her home at around 1030 in the morning. She walked around 10 minutes through a few different streets to a nearby cyber cafe that was around 650 meters from her home. And this cafe was kind of tucked away in an alleyway behind this big solid gate that was placed between other businesses on a very busy and main street. Now there was actually this reporter who recreated the route that Giselle had to take and to be honest it is a little bit scary. Like even as an adult I don't think I would ever do this path by myself. It's just very isolated and the distance that Giselle had to walk was pretty big for an 11 year old girl. Now granted this wasn't broad daylight you know Giselle knew everybody in the community and the main gate was on a busy road but still like anything can happen in broad daylight. The walk from the main gate through the alleyway to the cyber cafe is very isolated. It's just very frightening to know that Giselle would often make this walk all by herself. So while the main gate was on a busy street where everybody could see, you know, someone going in there, the cyber cafe was not on a busy street. Pasó por todos estos negocios que se encontraban abiertos en este momento, por la tortillería, por esta expendio de frutas y verduras y llegó hacia este sitio. Esta cerrada, este callejón que no tiene nombre, entró por esta puerta y caminó hasta el fondo de esta cerrada que no tiene nombre. Vino por aquí, probablemente el feminicida Roberto L de 51 años ya la había observado por las cámaras de seguridad que tiene. Como no lo han dicho las vecinas, también algunos testigos, desde aquí vigilaba a todas las personas que ingresaban. Esto lo hacía eh, bajo el argumento de para tener mayor seguridad. Y ya, por último llegó así este sitio. Tocó aquí porque se encontraba cerrado el cibercafé. Se cree que entró hacia este lugar que alcanzamos a ver. Tiene al menos cuatro o cinco computadoras. También hay algunos dulces. Se alcanzan a notar a través del espejo. Y fue la última vez que se vio con vida a la pequeñita. Este hombre la vio con vida de aquí. I don't know. It definitely looked very creepy to me, but I feel like sometimes there's no other options and that's just what Giselle had to work with. So Giselle arrived at the cyber cafe, which she had already been to multiple times with her family and she knocked on the door. However, that's when she realized that the cafe was actually closed. Now, this really wasn't that big of a deal. Oftentimes, the owner would still be inside getting everything ready and people would just knock on the door. He would let them in. They would go sit at a computer while he continued to finish, you know, opening up. So, Giselle knocked on the door. The owner let her inside early and she sat at computer number five and logged onto Facebook. She messaged her mom and asked her where her dad was because she wanted to get on the bus with him. Her mom was like, okay, let me figure it out. Like, let me call your dad let me figure out where his next stop is gonna be Giselle was like okay no worries medium coordinated with her husband and then she messaged Giselle back on Facebook letting her know where her dad's next stop would be however that's when Giselle stopped responding medium says that she called her through Facebook messenger but she received no response at this point medium assumed that maybe her daughter had already left the cafe to go wait at the bus stop for her dad like maybe she did read the message and was like okay like my dad's gonna be at this stop let me go there and start start waiting for him. However, later that day when her father arrived at the bus stop to pick her up, she wasn't there. The father called Miriam and was like, hey, Giselle isn't here. And Miriam was like, okay, let me message her on Facebook and figure out what happened. However, Miriam received no response once again. Both of the parents kind of started like arguing on the phone. Like Rigoberto was mad that Miriam had let Giselle go to the cafe all by herself. And Miriam was like, no, like I didn't give her permission to go all the way to that cafe because normally the siblings would go to one that was a little bit closer to their house but for some reason that day Giselle decided to go to that one which was a little bit further away. So they were kind of like arguing over the phone about why Giselle would go that far away but in the end they kind of just calmed down and were like okay our focus now is finding our daughter. Initially they thought that maybe she was with another family member or with a friend but they contacted everybody in their family, they contacted all of her friends and no one had seen or heard from Giselle. This only made the family's worries grow and grow. Where could she have gone? The family also went to all of the nearby businesses and they asked if anyone had seen Giselle. And that's when people said that they last saw her going into the cyber cafe, but that they never saw her leave. So the family went straight there, desperately looking for Giselle. They asked the owner if Giselle was there, but the owner said that he didn't even open his cyber cafe until 1.30 p.m. that day. So Giselle couldn't have been there since she was last heard from 
early in the morning. Now the family was a little bit confused because they were like, I mean, there's witnesses that saw her coming into the cyber cafe and she messaged us on Facebook from a computer. So how is that possible? Like, where is the inconsistencies? And the owner just kept being like very quiet. He was just like, I don't know what to tell you. Like I didn't open up until 1.30 p.m. today. The family starts looking around and they notice that the owner has cameras pointing outside the store. So they're like, can we look at the footage? And this is when the owner said no, that they couldn't look at the footage because the cameras did not work. So her family felt like they had reached a dead end. I mean, if the cameras didn't work and the owner said he hadn't seen her, they really had no other option but to believe him. And at this point, the family didn't know what else to do. So they went to the police station and they reported Giselle as missing. Now, unfortunately, this was not an easy process. Giselle's family said that the police were just not helpful and that they were not efficient in the entire investigation. It took them nearly six hours for them to be attended by police and they didn't even begin looking for their daughter until 36 hours after they reported her missing because it was quote the weekend. Can you believe that? Can you imagine going to police and reporting your 11 year old daughter as missing and being told that they're not going to look for her because it's a Saturday? It's horrible and I just feel like anytime I talk about cases in Mexico it just reminds me of how unfair things are, how there's so much corruption in the police stations. I don't know it's just hard to get people to care about you. Like really that's the truth. Like how do they not care about an 11 year old girl missing? The police officers should have started looking for Giselle that same day. The family was like okay I guess you're not going to look for our daughter but can you give us the security footage from the public street cameras that way we can see where she went to but that's when the police were like no you can't look at that footage because the cameras don't actually work so the family was just feeling very frustrated at this point they felt like the police had no sense of urgency to find their little girl they just felt like the police didn't care and at this point the family didn't know where else to go days passed and there were still no clues no signs of Giselle nothing thankfully the police did release an amber alert with all of Giselle's information information in hopes that they would receive a tip. When she disappeared, she was wearing an aqua green shirt, pink pants, and black tennis shoes. And at the same time, her family was also sharing her photo all over social media. Giselle's relatives, friends, and the neighbors organized a march to spread awareness about her disappearance and were chanting things like, Giselle, we want you back home. And they had also hung hundreds of flyers and posters around the area and were urging everyone to grab a flyer and to help them spread the word. Now, something that stuck out to me while doing the research for this case was that two mothers whose own young daughters also disappeared joined in the search for Giselle. One of the mothers was named Lydia and her daughter, Diana Florencio, was a the victim of femicide in 2017. She joined the search and said, quote, I am here in solidarity with Giselle's family. They must look for her. We have to do it ourselves because authorities are not going to do it. Another mom named Elena, whose 12 year old daughter Carol disappeared along with her nine year old cousin around the same area as Giselle in 2017, said, quote, I joined the search for Giselle because I know the pain of losing a daughter and that to date, in my case, the police have not told me anything. Seeing those mothers involved in the search just broke my heart because they know exactly what Giselle's family was going through. It was probably painful for them to be a part of these, you know, marches and a part of these searches because it probably brought them back memories of what it was like to look for their own loved ones. So it just broke my heart reading those statements, especially the one mother, Lydia, saying that authorities aren't going to help so they have to do it themselves. Like that is just such a reality for so many of these cases. So these mothers are just so incredibly strong and it's amazing that they were there to show the family as much support as possible. Giselle's mother Miriam also spoke with the family and through her cries she managed to say please give her back. I won't do anything. Please return her. The only thing I want is my daughter with me. Please if possible knock door by door to look for her. Thankfully the family had so much support from the community and everyone was doing their part in helping search for Giselle. On January 26, friends and family of Giselle along with civil organizations made their way to the capital and marched for authorities to search for Giselle and were demanding justice for her. The question everyone had was, what happened to Giselle at the cyber cafe? I mean, that was the last known place where she was at. So after sending the Facebook message to her mom, did she leave and start walking to the bus stop or something happened inside the cyber cafe? Well, as I mentioned earlier,
earlier, Giselle's family had gone to the cyber cafe when she first went missing to question the owner, but he said that his cameras didn't work and that he hadn't even opened the cafe until 1.30 p.m. So he wasn't too helpful with the family, but of course, police wanted to speak to him as well just to get a different perspective and to see if maybe he remembered something else. However, when police questioned the owner, they were pretty much met with the same thing that the family was initially told. The owner said that he didn't open the store until later that day, and when police kind of pushed him on this, he actually tried bribing them and offered them 6,000 pesos for them to not involve him in Giselle's disappearance. That is the most suspicious thing ever. I mean, it's one thing to just say like, hey, I really don't know anything, like can you leave me alone? But it's a different thing to actually bribe police officers to leave. Luckily, the police did not accept the bribe and they actually arrested him for attempting to bribe the police. He was pretty much now the number one suspect in the investigation because Giselle was last seen at his cafe and this man was now bribing the police to leave him alone. Definitely suspicious behavior, so police were able to obtain a search warrant for the cafe. Inside, police discovered a type of sheet that were actually used as curtains in the cafe, which will come to play a little bit later in the case. They also found like some other types of clothing, but they didn't know who this clothing belonged to. Police were also able to get the footage from the cameras outside the cyber cafe, and they saw that Giselle went inside, but she never came back out. Now, while police continued with the investigation, the search for Giselle went on. The family was still holding on to hope that she would be found alive and that everything would be okay. But unfortunately, on Sunday, January 27th, during one of the searches in the area of Ixtapaluca, the naked body of a young girl was found. This girl had similarities to Giselle. Now, when authorities told the family that a young girl's body had been found, the family wanted to go identify her, but they were actually not allowed to. Giselle's family was angry at this. I mean, they were like, hello, can we go see if that's our child? But the police said that this girl was very disfigured and pretty much unrecognizable and that it would be extremely hard for the family to see their daughter in that state if in fact this was Giselle. Miriam was like, okay, well, the little girl must have been wearing clothes. Like, can you show me the clothes so I can see if those are Giselle's? So police were like, okay, and they took a photo of the clothes. They sent it to Miriam. And unfortunately, the clothing that the little girl was wearing was the same clothing that Giselle was wearing the day she disappeared. So now Miriam could confirm that this was in fact her daughter. Of course, they also had to do DNA testing and this also confirmed that the little girl was indeed Giselle. Her body was severely disfigured because unfortunately, animals had gotten to her body and pretty much eaten most of her remains. The family's hopes to find her alive and bring her back home safely were just shattered. Their little girl was gone. Now, next to Giselle's body was a bed sheet along with her clothing, a con and undergarment fragments scattered around and near her body. On January 28th, 2019, Giselle's funeral was held and the family said their last goodbyes. There was also a mass held and so many people showed up to give their support to the family, offer their condolences, and just let the family know like, hey, we're not going to forget about this and Giselle will get justice. Her friends from school showed up, her soccer teammates, her neighbors. I mean, everyone was just so shocked that this happened to an 11-year-old little girl and they I just didn't understand why. I mean, why would someone do this? Giselle's body was then escorted to the cemetery for her to be buried, and Miriam was screaming and crying while tossing dirt over her daughter's coffin with a shovel. It just really broke my heart watching that video clip, and her grandpa came out and made a statement and said, quote, what kind of evil person can do this to an 11-year-old little girl? Someone that evil doesn't deserve to live on this earth. I mean, people all over the world were sharing their condolences with the family over social media because this was like a very big news story, not just like in Mexico City, but like in all of Mexico and everywhere else because this little girl was just trying to go to a cyber cafe to message her mom and then something terrible happened to her. After the funeral, the autopsy results came back. This revealed that Giselle suffered very harsh beatings, she had defensive wounds, and she also had signs of being abused. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Also on Giselle's body, there was DNA and when police went to go test the DNA found on Giselle to the DNA of the cafe owner, it came back as a match. Not only was his DNA found on Giselle's body, but the sheet that was found near her body was one of the same sheets that the owner had hung in his cyber cafe to use as a curtain. So with that, it became very obvious to police, to the family, to everyone that the owner of this 
Cafe was the killer. So, who is he? He is 51-year-old Roberto Buendia Diaz. So, Roberto was initially arrested for attempting to bribe the police officers, but now with all of this evidence, he was being held for the murder and our wording of Giselle. Now, his trial was actually postponed until March of 2020. I'm not sure if it was because of the pandemic. So, while the trial was postponed, the investigation continued and people actually came forward with allegations that he had engaged in inappropriate behavior towards minors in the past. So it seems like this wasn't the first time that he had been inappropriate with a young child. According to these witnesses, he had made vulgar comments about minors and had even inappropriately touched a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old in his cyber cafe. The parents of one of the girls became so angry about this that they actually physically confronted Roberto and beat him up. Now, I wasn't able to find any official reports on this, so I don't know if the families ever reported him to the police or if they just like beat him up and like took matters into their own hands. Some neighbors said that he was a very morbid person and that he would stare intensely at young girls. Just, oh my God, hearing that just creeped me out so much because it's it's so crazy because I used to go to cyber cafes all the time when I was little with just my sisters by ourselves. Like my mom would just drop us off there and then we would just like play Club Penguin or like play Webkins by ourselves for like hours. Granted, like the cafe that we would go to was family owned, like my uncle owned it. So like, I think that's why my mom felt more comfortable because like my cousins were there, but it's still scary to know because you just never know what can happen. So oh God, it's just so frightening because the fact that they're saying that he would stare intensely at young girls is so scary because I'm sure those young girls were all by themselves in the cafe. So it's just really creepy to know that, like, I feel like sometimes we just don't think about the dangers of stuff and you're like, oh, they'll be safe in a cafe. Like there's other people there, but again, you just never know. Witnesses also stated that he would watch corn inside his cyber cafe without even caring if he had clients there using the computers. So he was just like an overall very gross, inappropriate, and just terrible person. According to authorities, the only record that he had was because of one time he was carrying a firearm, but that was it. Now, during the investigation and the trial, his cyber cafe was now boarded up and Giselle's family were outside of the cafe every single day, you know, fighting to ensure that Giselle case did not go cold. They were hanging up these posters in front of his cafe saying justice for Giselle and having vigils there, etc. Finally, when the trial began in 2020, the evidence and the witnesses they gathered throughout the year were presented, but Roberto was adamant that he was innocent. He literally said that he had nothing to do with this, that he didn't even know Giselle, nothing. Miriam said that she just could not believe this. She's like, really? Like, there's all this evidence against you. Your DNA was found on her. There's there's footage of her entering the cafe but never leaving. Like, I don't know how he is still denying this. She was just so angry that he wouldn't accept, you know, taking responsibility for what he did. Thankfully, as the trial progressed, Roberto finally confessed. He said that his conscience was eating away at him and that he just wanted to come forward with the truth. So let's talk about his confession. Roberto said that that day before Giselle arrived at the cyber cafe, he was out drinking with a friend and that they drank the entire night until around five o'clock in the morning. When he arrived back home, he was of course so drunk that he couldn't open up the cafe. So he was basically just like hanging out in his room, like plastered out of his mind. Now the cyber cafe was a part of his house. Like it's just very common in like Mexico and like other countries to have a business in your home. So the front part of his house was a cafe and then there was a door in the cafe that led to you know his house where he would sleep and live so he was in his room just like out of his mind when all of a sudden at around 11 a.m he heard Giselle knocking on the door so he got up he opened the door he told her that he wasn't open yet but Giselle was like please can I just come inside to use the computer so I can talk to my mom and Roberto was like I mean okay I guess I'm not open but sure use the computer so it was basically just him and Giselle inside his cyber cafe at around around 11 o'clock in the morning. Giselle sat at the computer, she messaged her mom, and then afterwards, Roberto said that he invited her to the back room, which again, was not a part of his business, but in his own home, to drink a soda. Giselle said yes. I know a lot of people question why she would say yes, you know, why she would go in this room with him. We don't know why. You know, 
she's 11 years old. Maybe she just wanted a soda. You know, it was 11 o'clock in the morning. So maybe she felt like it was safe enough to go back there. And again, this is like a public cyber cafe. So maybe she assumed that more people would arrive later. I don't know. But in the end, Giselle agreed to go into his room to drink a soda. Once she entered the bedroom, that is when Roberto began committing this horrible crime. He began to R word her and she was fighting back and scratching at him and just, you know, fighting to save her life. And Roberto said that he couldn't control control her or calm her down because she was literally screaming so he began hitting her in the stomach to subdue her then when he finished r wording her he said that he was thinking of letting giselle go home he was like yeah i wasn't planning on killing her like i wanted her to leave but then when i looked at her she looked really sad and she looked really scared so that scared me yeah that's what he said that he was scared that giselle was gonna go to the police or to her family to report him he didn't want to go to jail so that's why he decided to kill he grabbed her from behind and then he began strangling her until she passed away. He left her body there in his bedroom. Like he didn't go leave, dispose of her body, nothing. He left her body in the bedroom and then proceeded to open up his cyber cafe at around 1.30 p.m. And then went on his day as if nothing had happened. Clients entered the cafe, used the computer, bought drinks from him. He chatted with people as if he hadn't just brutally attacked and killed an 11 year old little girl whose body was still in the room next door once the business day concluded at around 9 p.m he stripped giselle's body wrapped her in the sheet along with the condom a pillow toilet paper her clothes and put it all in his trunk and then he drove to an empty landscape and just left her body there I know it's a lot to take in. I reading the details of this just made me feel sick to my stomach to be honest to know or to even just imagine what Giselle had to go through in her final moments is horrifying and it just breaks my heart. She was an 11 year old little girl like she didn't deserve this and I just can't believe that he blamed this on alcohol. Like I'm sorry what? If getting drunk causes you to act that way that is truly frightening and there's no way that alcohol made you do this. Like I truly believe like if you acted that way it's because you always had that in you not because the alcohol made you do that i hope that made sense but i just could not believe that he was blaming it on alcohol thankfully on march 14th 2020 roberto was sentenced to 83 years in prison when they read his sentence to him he had his head down the entire time after learning of the sentence miriam said quote nothing will return my daughter i think the most fair punishment was for him to be burned alive so you know it doesn't really feel like the biggest justice in the world or like the worst punishment ever but you know medium was happy that he was going to be going to jail for a very long time but at the same time she also just felt like jail was not punishment enough for this man who ended the life of her 11 year old daughter now, Giselle's case was one of the very few where the person responsible is actually punished. On average, in Mexico, 10 women are killed a day, and 90% of the crimes go unpunished. Giselle's case was a victory in this movement against femicides, and the judge said that they hope that this case works as like an example to others, that, that justice can be achieved. Giselle's family thanked the community for all the support and love that they have shown them during this entire time. Rigoberto said, quote, It was a very difficult year no longer being with her and being uncertain that justice would be done. I would like this Mexico to be different because one can no longer walk freely in the street without thinking that something could happen to us in the street. Just like in Giselle's case where police had no sense of urgency to look for her, there are so many other cases where authorities simply don't do enough. People in Mexico are sick of the negligence they face when it comes to investigating femicides. There are just so many cases like this where authorities are negligent. Like I said, it's just hard to get them to care about you. It's hard to get them to care about your loved one's disappearance, about your loved one's murder. This is why just so many times neighbors and families want to take matters into their own hands because they're just sick of feeling neglected and ignored by authorities when it comes to their missing and murdered loved ones. Thanks to protests and march and the widespread share of hashtag ni una mas on social media, more progress is being made, but of course not nearly enough. As for Giselle's family, they continue to spread awareness on femicides and will always speak about their daughter. A plastic mouse toy sits near her photograph in the family's home and a white bow still hangs outside their house as a sign of mourning through teary eyes her father rigoberto said quote we have to learn to live without our daughter remembering her happiness and mischievousness someday we will see her again and we will once again be that happy family forever 
They urge families to not stop fighting for their loved ones and to not let any crime go unpunished. They said, quote, Our lives changed. We are not the same family. We have to learn to live without our daughter, remembering how she was happy and mischievous. She is taking care of us from above. And with that, that is what happened to Giselle. I know it was a lot to take in. I mean, I just can't believe it that this guy was blaming alcohol for this. That's the most disgusting thing that I've ever heard in my life. And the fact that other witnesses have seen stated that they saw him looking at girls that he would watch corn in front of people that he even touched two girls just shocks me and i definitely wish that they had reported this to the police but as i mentioned a lot of the times things just don't get taken care of by the police which is why i feel like the mom took matters into her own hands by beating him up but still i definitely think it should have been reported or at least you know warned other parents about his behavior so that other people wouldn't let their children go there by themselves it's really scary and like i said we definitely Definitely should not blame the parents or blame Giselle for going into the back room with him. We don't know how he was able to lure her. I mean, he says that he offered her a soda, but who knows? He could have just grabbed her and taken her back there. It's just really frightening. So definitely just talk to your kids about this. Talk to them about stranger danger. Even if it's like the local worker at your Starbucks that, that always gives your kid, you know, their refresher. Just because they know them and they like are familiar with them doesn't mean that they're not a stranger. So I feel like this could be the case for Giselle you know she would often go to the cyber cafe with her family with her siblings or by herself so maybe in her mind she felt like she knew the owner because she would always see him but just because you're like familiar with them doesn't mean that they're trustworthy so I feel like it's really important to talk to your kids about that and kind of just differentiate like this is just someone that you know this is someone that you can trust in the end it's just all really heartbreaking but I am happy that Giselle did receive justice Thank you guys again so much for being here. I would love to know your thoughts on this case. And if there's ever any other cases that you would like me to cover, make sure to leave me a comment down below or you can add it to my case suggestion form, which is in the description box down below. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys.